Chapter Twenty Seven of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The end of the race. Far behind him, he could see the pursuers driving their horses at a killing gallop. He answered their spurt and held them safely in the distance with the very slightest of efforts. All his care was given to picking out the easiest way and avoiding jutting rocks and sharp turns which might unsettle the rider, just as in those dim old days in the pasture when the short brown legs of the boy could not encompass him enough to gain a secure grip, he used to halt gently and turn gently, for fear of unseating the urchin. How far more cautious was his maneuvering now! Here on his back was the power which had saved him from the river. Here on his back was he whose trailing fingers had given him his first caress. He had no power of reason in his poor blind brain to teach him the why and the wherefore but he had that overmastering impulse which lives in every gentle-blooded horse, the great desire to serve. A Mustang would have been incapable of such a thing, but in Alcatraz flowed the pure strain of the thoroughbred, tracing back to the old desert stock where the horse lives in the tent of his master, the most cherished member of the family. There was in him dim knowledge of events through which he himself had never passed. By the very lines of his blood there was bred in him a need for human affection and human care, just as there was bred in him the keen heart of the racer. And now he knew to the full that exquisite delight of service with the very life of a helpless man given into his keeping. One ear he canted back to the pain-roughened voice which spoke at his ear. The voice was growing weaker and weaker just as the grip of the legs was decreasing, and the hands were tangled less firmly in his mane. But now the bright-colored buildings of the ranch appeared through the trees. They were passing between the deadly rows of barbed wire, with far-off mutter of the pursuing horses beating at his ear, and telling him that all escape was cut off. Yet still the man held him to the way through a mingling of trails thick with the sense of man and man-ridden horses. The burden on his back now slipped from side to side at every reach of his springy gallop. They came in sight of the ranch house itself. The failing voice rose for one instant into a hoarse cry of joy. Far behind rose a triumphant echo of shouting. Yes, the trap was closed, and his only protection from the men riding behind was this half-living creature on his back. Out from the arched entrance of the patio ran a girl. She started back against the adobe wall of the house and threw up one hand as though a miracle had flashed across her vision. Alcatraz brought his canter to a trot that shook the loose body on his back, and then he was walking reluctantly forward, for towards the girl the rider was directing him against all his power of reason. She was crying out now in a shrill voice, and presently... Through the shadowy arch swung the figure of a big man on crutches, who shouted even as the girl had shouted. Oliver Jordan, reading through the lines of his foreman's letter, had returned to find out what was going wrong, and from his daughter's tale he had learned more than enough. Trembling at the nearness of these two human beings, but driven on by the faint voice and the guiding hands, Alcatraz passed shuddering, under the very arch of the patio entrance, and so found himself once more and forever surrendered into the power of men. But the weak figure on his back had relaxed and was sliding down. He saw the gate closing the patio swing to. He saw the girl run with a cry and receive the bleeding body of Red Paris into her arms. He saw the man on the crutches swing towards them, exclaiming, Without even a bridle, Marianne, he must have hypnotized that horse. Oh, Dad, the girl wailed. If he dies, if he dies. The eyes of Paris, where he lay on the flagging, opened wearily. I'll live. I can't die. But Alcatraz, keep him from the butcher Hervey. Keep him safe. Then his gaze fixed on the face of Oliver Jordan, 
and his eyes widened in amazement. "'My father,' she said, as she cut away the shirt to get at the wound. "'Him?' muttered Paris. "'Partner,' said Oliver Jordan, wavering above the wounded man on his crutches. "'What's done is done.' "'Aye,' said Paris, smiling weakly. "'If you're her father, then that trail is sure ended. "'Marianne, get hold of my hand. "'I'm going out again. "'Keep Alcatraz safe.' "'His eyes closed in a faint. "'Between the cook and Marianne, "'they managed to carry the limp figure "'into the shelter of the arcade, "'just as Hervey and his men "'thundered up to the closed gate of the patio. "'And there the foreman drew rain in a cloud of dust "'and cursed his surprise at the sight of the ranchman.' The group in the patio and the shining form of Alcatraz were self-explanatory. His plans were ruined at the very verge of triumph. He hardly needed to hear the voice of Jordan saying, "'I asked you to get rid of a gun-fighting killer, and you've tried to murder a man. Hervey, get out of the valley and stay out if you're fond of a whole skin.' And Hervey went. There followed a strange time for Alcatraz. He could not be led from the patio. They could only take him by tying every hoof and dragging him, and such force Marianne would not let the cowpunchers use. So day after day he roamed in that strange corral while men came and stared at him through the strong bars of the gate. But no one dared enter the enclosure with a wild horse saving the girl alone, and even she could not touch him. It was all very strange, and the strangest of all was when the girl came out of the door through which the master had been carried and looked at Alcatraz and wept. Every evening she came, but she had no way of answering the anxious whinny with which he called for Red Jim again. Strange, too, was the hush which brooded over the house. Even the cowpunchers, when they came to the gate, talked softly, but still the master did not come. Two weeks dragged on, weary weeks of waiting, and then the door to the house opened, and again they carried him out on a wicker couch, a pale and wasted figure, around whom the man on the crutches and the girl and a half a dozen cowpunchers gathered, laughing and talking all at once. "'Stand back from him now,' ordered Marianne, "'and watch Alcatraz.' So they drew away under the arcade, and Alcatraz heard the voice of the master calling weakly. It was not well that the others should be so near, for how could one tell from what hand a rope might be thrown or in what hand a gun might suddenly flash? But still the voice called, and Alcatraz went slowly, snorting his protest and suspicion, until he stood at the foot of the couch and stretching forth his nose, still with his frightened glance fixed on the watchers, Alcatraz sniffed the hand of Red Jim. It turned, it patted him gently. It drew his gaze away from the others and into the eyes of this one man, the mysterious eyes which understood so much. A lone trail is right enough for a while, old boy, Red Jim was saying, but in the end we need partners, a man and a woman, and a horse and a man. And Alcatraz, feeling the trail of the fingertips across the velvety skin of his muzzle, agreed. End of chapter 27 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas End of Alcatraz by Max Brand